For more information, New York State's Department of Environmental Conservation produced a documentary called Uninvited, the Spread of Invasive Species. You can find a link to watch that complete program at nynow.org. And now, I'm happy to be joined at the Reporters' Roundtable for a discussion of more of this week's news by Grace Ashford of The New York Times and Zach Williams from The New York Post. Thanks very much for coming in. Thanks for having us. So, at last, after two months of waiting, we have a request for proposals for an after-action report on the state's reaction to COVID-19. Uh, this has been something that lots of people on both sides of the aisle have been clamoring for. What does the RFP kind of tell us about what the scope of that work by an outside private consultant is going to be, and what are the prospects for it to be substantial and, and you know, uh, taken well when it comes out? So the, uh, the scope is pretty wide-ranging. It's going to be looking at the state's uh, handling of uh, patients into congregate settings, which has obviously been you know, very, very big and contested. Um, it's going to be looking at some procurement questions. It's going to be looking at um, uh, the way that the state makes decisions about education, when to open uh, schools, um, you know, and down to uh, nursery schools. Um, I think the, the, the key question that you're sort of uh, zeroing in on is, you know, will this be substantial? Will this be independent? Um, it is being handled, uh, you know, by the executive and then uh, I believe Jackie Bray over at the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, um, who actually ran a good deal of the city's COVID response, is going to be overseeing it. Um, one thing that I thought was pretty interesting was that they, they are uh, eliminating from consideration anyone who has done work with the state during this COVID process, which is a lot of people. In including like heavy hitters like McKinsey and Company, yeah. which is problematic in all sorts of ways, but um, they of course worked on the Department of Health's nursing home report that came out in July of 2020 and was you know hugely controversial. So, so they are right out of that work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I would just add that a key thing in the middle of this investigation is the gubernatorial election. Now, if, it cont if this RFP is for a one-year investigation, in the middle of it, we've got to see, will Kathy Hochul get reelected and this investigation will continue as she designed it? Or might Lee Zeldin stop this investigation, start his own? He has vowed to have his own investigation, and he says he might take or leave whatever Hochul might get going if he's lucky enough to win the November election, of course. Yeah, well, the, the big question is who is going to get selected to do it? Who are the investigators going to be? And mm -hmm. yeah, will the executive chamber be able to kind of keep its its mitts off the, the final work product? So um, we want to turn to Zach, a story that uh, you printed in the post looking at Kathy Hochul's uh, flights, her use of state aircraft, um, in specific, $170,000 uh, paid for by taxpayers, more than 100 flights between the end of August and the, and the end of March. So that $170,000 is a ballpark figure. We don't know exactly, um, not least because the governor hasn't released all of her public schedules detailing just how many flights. We do know it's at least 140, 131 hours in the air. And Hochul, like many governors before, both inside and outside New York, is being accused of abusing it either for her political benefit or her private benefit. I think one flight that really stuck out to me was a September flight just to see the Buffalo Bills home opener in Buffalo. She flew from New York City to Buffalo, saw the game, spent the night, and then flew right back to New York City early the next morning. And I think examples like that really challenge the idea that all of these flights in their entirety, as she has said, um, are just for official state business for the benefit of the taxpayer. The, the governor's initial response to this was to say, we're using the plane to um, connect with constituents, voters all across the state, as well as citizens. The use of voters, <laughs> one imagines, probably made her staff uh, groan a little bit, without a doubt. Yeah, Republicans jumped on that pretty quickly and said, she said the quiet part out loud. You know, of course, a lot of these flights were for legitimate, what it looks like, legitimate government business, press conferences, um, disaster briefings, meeting with other government officials. But we would also see, as a Times Union has reported um, months and months ago that, you know, she would also sprinkle in these private events, campaign events typically, so that she can make maximum, uh, take maximum advantage of all these different trips around the state. Um, uh, moving to Washington, D.C., there was a vote on uh, a bill that would uh, essentially uh, protect um, existing 
marriages, same sex, as well as interracial across the state, just on the chance that the Supreme Court decides to go after the Obergefell decision um, from 2015. Um, what was interesting about that is it got 47 Republican votes, um, including every member of the New York delegation, GOP delegation, except for Claudia Tenney from central New York. I was really struck by this. I, I thought this was pretty surprising. It's not so long ago that even mainstream Democrats were hesitant to voice their support. You know, notably Barack Obama in his first campaign, uh, you know, stopped short of saying that he supported gay marriage. So the fact that now uh, there are a majority of New York uh, representatives from the Republican Party who are supporting this and who are saying, you know, I was wrong, um, you know, back then, even when they when they themselves voted against, uh, you know, New York's law is pretty interesting. At the same time, I don't think we should kid ourselves that the, you know, Republican Party has moved, you know, hugely on this. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of <clears throat> transgender, uh, you know, bills that are being considered, and especially in the realm of health care for minors. Um, but it's certainly interesting in the, you know, c context of all of these other kind of culture war type issues that are happening, abortion um, and, uh, you know, access to contraception, uh, mostly. I think it's clear that the Republicans are feeling a little bit uncomfortable um, and considering these issues in the uh, upcoming elections. What's interesting with Claudia Tenney, the lone Republican in the state delegation who voted against this, was she kind of used a, an excuse similar to what other Republicans have said about abortion, that here in New York it's settled law, and she supports settled law, but that she won't proactively um, actually w vote to codify her actual beliefs. So she's trying to have it kind of both ways. She is in a district that is very red, um, a very red district at this point. So she's probably thinking more about potential vulnerabilities to her political right in a primary more than, you know, New York State voters' attitudes as a whole on this issue. We, we should note that uh, Claudia Tenney voted against marriage equality when she was a state assemblywoman as well. So mm. at least give her points for consistency on this. Um, we are talking Friday morning on Thursday evening out in Rochester. Lee Zeldin was accosted, attacked by a man who was uh, holding what is uh, called a knuckle knife, um, basically sort of a two-pronged blade. Very scary scene that was, of course, caught on, on video. Um, it, it's unclear at this point what this uh, man's motivation might have been, but at, at this point, sort of what's the state of play of how this is playing out politically? Thank goodness nobody was hurt. Well, this was a really strange situation, because just earlier in the day, the governor, at perhaps an a attempt at humor, had um, released a spoofed version of Zeldin's public schedule that basically <coughs> said, oh, he'll at this time, he'll talk about his vote against the 2020 election results, obviously some that he has been involved with too much controversy, or that this and that. And then, lo and behold, hours later, um, somebody actually commits an act of violence at a Zeldin campaign event outside Rochester. Now, we don't know the person's motivation, um, but it was not a good look for the Hochul campaign that they had kind of, you know, said at least, you know, that he was having events at this time, they didn't give specific locations, but Republicans quickly kind of moved to draw a link between, again, this attempt at humor that she had and what happened to Zeldin, and I guess we'll just see how it plays out in the campaign. Right. Well, that's where we're going to have to leave it. So thanks very much to Grace Ashford of The New York Times. Please come back. And Zach Williams of The New York Post. Thank you.